Okay, thank you ladies and gentlemen for coming to the Brooklyn Tea Party meeting for our May meeting. Uh, just a couple notes uh, before we start with our guest speaker, Michael Grillo. Uh, we have uh, just a couple of notes. Uh, one is that I ask everyone to please register someone you might know. Register them as a Republican. I have voter registration forms if you uh, need one. At least get one or two people. I registered two people last week uh, from Democrat to Republican. Start switching people. It's important to get registered Republicans. We need them for the primary, especially for a New York State primary for Trump. We need them to vote in the primary. But besides that, we need living Republicans to sign petitions. And without that, they can't sign a petition if they're not a registered Republican, you're not going to have Republicans running in offices. That's why when you go to the voting booth, or machine, or sign-in these days, or paper ballot, or whatever they want, uh, you might sometimes see a race where it's Democrat versus no one. That's because either a person didn't want to run, there was no one to run, or there is someone that wanted to run, but they didn't get enough signatures to get on the ballot. <laughs> They didn't get enough signatures because it might have been that there was not enough Republicans that are alive to sign that petition. They might be on the rolls where it says they're a registered Republican, but they could have moved, and these lists never get updated. And they're 103 years old, but they've been dead for Right. <laughs> or they actually are 103, but can't sign. I have actually had a 100-year-old person sign a petition once. Um, but so that that's normally what happens. Yes. Is there any bricks and mortar location that we can go to to change our <coughs> party registration? You could uh, well, you could change your what do you mean? Change your party registration. Bricks and mortar, a building we can walk into. Yeah, the Board of Elections in downtown Brooklyn. Three was it? Sixty Adams Street. Adams Street, right across the Supreme Court. Three sixty Adams. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you could do that, or you could do it by paper. And uh, it's important because we need living people to sign these petitions. Uh, as we're seeing also in the current events column of our dear president, he was at the G7, and that was fun, right, everyone? He <laughs> stumbled down the stairs again. Folks, folks, folks. Like, ooh, uh, <laughs> so he was like, folks, folks, folks. he was re, uh, um, I guess, enacting the Poseidon adventure. Uh, Next time you'll see him flipping upside down, holding on to a Christmas tree that's bolted to the ceiling, well, was to the floor. But uh, this guy is just uh, all over the map. The latest Harris uh, Harvard poll has Trump up by a lot of percentage points. I think DeSantis says 16 percent, and so Trump I think 62 percent in the in the primary. But even though you saw the Fox News poll that everyone's talking about, oh. Harry, I mean, uh, Biden versus Trump. Biden's leading by 7%. Who are these people? Keep in mind, Fox. Fox don't like Donald Trump, okay? You have um, people, um, uh, Rupert Murdoch and friends, they don't like Trump. So don't get that twisted. That poll is skewed. They used to. Right. But now they don't. And so now you have the... Um, Harvard uh, sorry, Harris poll. So the Harvest, Harvard Harris poll, that don't sound like a conservative poll to me, does it? No. But it has Trump up by 7%. Now, of course, let's not get too excited about these polls to begin with. It's too early. Everything is, you know, and polls are notoriously wrong to begin with. But it's nice to hear that your, your guy is ahead. I mean, let's not be, <laughs> it's better than saying that he's behind. We all know what happened all of the in the comparative. There's a website called yeah. 538 that lists all of the polls. Yeah, on, so. on, on, on practically everything. The problem is we're yes. facing a demographics problem. Every year, five million new Gen Zs become of age to vote. Right. Unlike previous generations, they also participate in the electoral system, and 70 percent of them identify as socialists. Trump lost the popular vote by 2.1 million against Hillary. He lost by 5 million against 
Biden the last time around, and you got 20 million new voters on the rolls, plus ballot harvesting, it, it means that Republicans are going to have an extremely difficult time keeping the Senate, keeping the House, and even if they have an outside shot at winning the presidency. That is why it's important to register so, people that you know that are obviously going to vote your way. Uh, don't vote, don't register someone that's going to be a raging liberal. Okay? They have plenty of organizations to help them out, I'm sure. So with that being said, before we start our main event, uh, let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. And um, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to have our featured guest speaker, Michael Grillo. But, is it really Michael? <laughs> I don't know. The camera will uh, reveal who's actually going to be arriving here. Um, I think we got access to the H.G. Wells time machine. And we've got him before his 1799 uh, death's bed. We got him when he was healthy. We got him in his... Uh, uh, Spry days, I guess we'll say, um, in 17, what, whatever we think. 1776. There we go. Bicentennial. Everyone. A lot going on in New York. When we were all 200 years old in 1976, and I was a year and change. I don't remember it, but it must have been a fun time during that time. But we got him. We got him, guys. We got him. We got him, and here he is. Ladies and gentlemen, General and President George Washington. Thank you for having me here this afternoon as well. Well, for me, it is May 1776. And it's an anticipation of a lot of important things going on right now. My headquarters have been set up at the old Kennedy Mansion on Number One Broadway, right across the road from Fort George. And why is my headquarters there? Why do I have 6,500 men that I took down here? And why did I evacuate Boston back in March 17th of this year of 76? Well, that's very simple. That's the day when the British evacuated Boston. Right now, they are heading our way towards the city of New York. Once they left Boston, they went up to Halifax. They went up to Nova Scotia up in uh, Canada. They're not there for pleasure, they're not there on a vacation. They're there to get more supplies, more troops. Waiting for another 10 to 20,000 British troops, and 10 of them are from the Principality of Hesse and Kassel. You commonly would probably call them Germans, we call them Hessians, because I never heard of a country Germany in 1776. Not just yet anyway, not till your future. So here we are, New York Harbor, right now, as I speak to you, in the year 1776, is filled up with probably 150 British warships at this moment. And they're offloading supplies and troops in Richmond County and Staten Island in preparation of attacking our grand city of New York. Now, my orders from the Continental Congress from Mr. John Hancock is to hold the city as long as possible. How am I preparing for this other than fortifying New York City? We have the battery at the lower tip, commanded by a young man who's 21 years old from St. Nevis that everyone's been talking about lately, Mr. Alexander Hamilton. He's a captain of the New York City Artillery Company. There is Fort Box, Fort Greene, Fort Putnam set up off the coast of Long Island, where we are right now, close to the village of New Utrecht, the largest Dutch village that happens to be on Long Island at this time. And there's other fortifications on Manhattan being built. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to tell Colonel McGraw, I need a fortification on the highest mountain peak in Manhattan. And you're probably looking like, where are the mountains of Manhattan? Oh, they are there. They're probably buried underneath all your futuristic things that you're used to seeing today. The highest mountain peak, Mount Washington, as it's going to be called very soon in two weeks. Colonel McGraw is going to build a fortification along the Hudson there, and he's going to christen it Fort Washington, and it will keep that name till November when the British unfortunately will overwhelm us. So we're in preparation right now. 
British warships are trying to go up and down the Hudson River or North River, bombarding the city, trying to uh, entice the inhabitants, get them angry and frustrated, most likely trying to get, put fear into their eyes. Uh, I don't know how fearful they're going to be. I know Mr. Hamilton is going to get into trouble firing back a cannon too soon at those British warships. And I believe Mr. Samuel Francis, who started that famous uh, tavern we all know of on Pearl Street, back in 1762, has a British a cannonball dislodged in the walls of that famous tavern that he happens to own right now. So for May, we get to June. June comes by, that fortification of Fort Washington is built. We have barricades put in the Hudson River. We're trying to get as many uh, decommissioned ships and boats to sink in the Hudson River to prevent any warships going up north to the river, which unfortunately are failing at this moment. How many more troops are going to arrive here? Right now, I have about 13,500 Continental Army troops and militia. Probably only 9,000 are fit for duty. The rest are sick in camp with dysentery and tuberculosis and smallpox. I have a shortage of supplies here. I'm trying to get more and more supplies paid for the troops. We need gunpowder. We need muskets. And I keep writing letters to John Hancock, the president of the Congress at the moment, to supply our troops. It all falls on deaf ears. A lot of our troops, yes, we do have muskets. We do have enough, a little bit of gunpowder, but not enough. We're getting militia units coming down from upper Westchester County and Dutchess down to the city with flailing sticks and picks forks. That's the only weapons they have. How is this going to be possible? How is this going to go on? And as time goes on, of course, the future is going to tell us what's going to go on. So now June to July. Early July, on July 6, I receive a letter from the Continental Congress. And it's that very important letter, with an important document. A document that was voted on on the 2nd of July of 1776. The Declaration of Independence. Now the Declaration of Independence was suggested in June. Around June 7, Light Horse Harry Lee, a member of the Congress for Virginia, arrives in Philadelphia and he exclaims in front of the Continental Congress that Virginia formally voted to be independent from Great Britain and we should be doing the same. They get a committee together. Mr. Jefferson's penning it with help of Mr. Franklin and Mr. Adams and Mr. Rutledge. All these men getting together for that very important document. And that document was written within weeks. It didn't take months and it didn't take years. Now, when I received the document on July 6th of this year, 76, I was told I have to read it to the troops. So I picked the time, 6 p.m., July 9th, on the city commons. The city commons happens to be the largest park in the city of New York at this time. You know it as City Hall Park. There's a fountain in the middle of your City Hall Park, and that is rumored to be the spot where I have my men read the declaration. So I have officers in secession reading different parts of it. Now the document's not long, you could read it in about 8 to 11 minutes. I've done it myself many, many times on the anniversary of July 4th. And after the declaration was read, some of the soldiers paraded down to the old park, Bowling Green Park, which has been around since 1761, and in your world, it still exists today. If you went to the thick post on the southern end of that park, the jagged edges are on there for a reason, because they used to be ornamentation, little St. Edward crown, the British royal crowns. And then that evening of July 9th, when those soldiers marched down to Bowling Green Park, the gold gilded statue that was only sitting there for five years because it was erected in 1771 was torn down. The gold leaf removed and sold off. The lead underneath was melted down to make 30,000 musket balls. And those crowns were hacked off with a hacksaw. So now we have trouble. I was very upset at the act of vandalism, but I supported the zeal of my troops for morale or what they did. Do I want to see them act this way again? Absolutely not. 
So now we formally declare independence from Great Britain. More warships are in the harbor. By the time we get to August, there's about 350 British warships before us. So if you're standing there by the artillery battery, which you call Battery Park today, look into the harbor. Imagine 350 British warships crammed together off the coast of Staten Island, and it looks like a forest of trees. They are so close together that you could probably hop aboard one ship to another to get to that little English village, which originally was a Dutch village called Brookland. I know most of you are calling it by its Dutch name today, Brooklyn. August 27th. Gravesend Bay, not too far from where we are right now, a few miles away, those British warships come across. We have these wooden landing crafts, the doors come down. In your future world, you are not going to see a flotilla, an invasion force, going upon any beach like this till your 1944. I want you to go to 1944 just one second for me. Yes, it's in the future for me. I just know a little bit about it, what I've been told by some futuristic people. Those metal landing crafts that land on Normandy, the doors come down, that was not a new invention because the British were using that invention, only there were wooden ships at this landing at Gravesend Bay. Thousands of British and Hessian troops come ashore. There's another group of boats coming across near Red Hook, offloading Hessians and Highlanders. We're surrounded now. This is the first true battle of the American War for Independence, as you call the American Revolution, the Battle of Brooklyn. Imagine, imagine the scene. Imagine where I am right now. It's all farmland in 1776. Mostly rye and buckwheat's being grown out here on the island. Not too far away, I know there's another strange structure with the initials I-T-E-A, there's a grist mill. And at that grist mill, there's about 400 brave Marylanders from the colony of Maryland defending that site. And the Royal Highland Regiment, the 71st, the 48th Frasers, and the 42nd Royal Highland Regiment, the Highland Brigades, attack the Marylanders. It's a massacre. It's like what happened thousands of years ago with the ancient Greeks with that massacre that took place back then. This is our massacre that's on par with that. We lose 3,000 men during the Battle of Long Island, the Battle of Brooklyn. They come, when they land at Gravesend Bay, they're taking the village of Gravesend, New Utrecht, quite easily. They take over Flatbush, Bushwick. Some British troops are going up to the Jamaica Pass. The biggest mistake I made was not having enough troops guarding the Jamaica Pass at this point. So now, a gentleman by the name of Nathaniel Woodhull, a brave officer in the Continental Army, he's also a cattle drover, so he's bringing the cattle so the troops can have enough to eat. He gets ambushed out there in Jamaica. You have one officer that runs him through with a sword because this brave soul refuses to take the oath of allegiance to King George III. Where did this happen? There's a tavern not too far from here. It's on your 84th Street, not too far from the Utrecht Avenue, and it was Barry's Tavern. He was run through in that tavern. Luckily, there was one British soldier that actually did take pity on him, and this officer loaded him into a wagon, took him back home to the village of Setauket so he could be buried in his family plot. But we lost 3,000 men. 3,000 brave men during the Battle of Long Island, the Battle of Brooklyn. And on the 28th, we decide to have a meeting. And I meet my officers in the village of Red Hook at the Red Lion Tavern. To give you an idea where that tavern was located, it's at near the gates opening off of 4th Avenue of Greenwood Cemetery. So we meet at that, that tavern. The discussion is, I only have 9,000 men left. I want to save them. How do we do this? Well, there's a gentleman by the name of Colonel John Glover. He's a commander in one of the regiments from Massachusetts Bay. He comes from Marblehead, and he happens to be a fisherman by trade and a sailor. He knows how to handle ships, so does all the troops that happens to be in his regiment. He promises me by tomorrow evening, the 29th, 
I'm going to get enough boats and landing craft to... And he keeps true to his word. How is this happening on all those warships in the harbor? Luckily, probably by divine province, we have a storm that's brewing up yet again. It's been raining for 24 hours. Fog rolls into the harbor. So those British sailors on those ships can't really see anything. But then again, you got to deal with the noise of the boats. So Colonel Glover decided to get rags, wrap them around the oars. The swivels that are on those boats are going to squeak a bit. So if you wrap it around the swivels of the oars when you're rowing them, they're not going to make much noise. I was the last man off of Long Island. I wanted to make sure every single one of those troops were evacuated back to the city of New York. And it did happen. By the time the sun started to come up, I was safely back in the city. What's my job now? To fortify that city, to make it stronger, to protect it while the British are beginning their seven long years of occupation in the city of New York. Now, this isn't done for the Battle of New York, because remember, they haven't taken the city yet, but then you have Long Island. I moved my headquarters up the Albany Post Road to the village of Harlem. Harlem, Harlem is a lovely village at this time, an old Dutch village. There's a home there that belonged to a gentleman by the name of Colonel Roger Morris. Mr. Morris built that home in 1765. He is a loyalist, a retired British officer. I did know him at some point, 20 years earlier, during the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War. Both of us were present when General Braddock was killed back in 1755. So now I have this grand home to use as my headquarters. Harlem is high ground, it's mountainous, so I could see down the coast of Manhattan Island. A week and a half goes by. Lord Richard Howe brings his warships to Kepps Bay, or Kipps Bay. To give you an idea for you people in the future where that happens to be, think about that rectangular glass building you call the UN building. That was part of a buckwheat farm that was owned by the Murray family. Think of an area in Manhattan called Murray Hill as being old farmland. I have young soldiers. Some just joined the army weeks before. They've never seen a battle yet. Imagine you're 15 years old maybe as old as 27, and you are standing there. You're a baker, you're a blacksmith, you're a cord waiter, you make boots, things out of leather. You happen to also be a cooper, you make buckets, you make butter churns. That's your skill, but you do have the zeal, you do have the fortification to try to fight against the strongest army in the world. And you're standing there with a musket on your shoulder, and all of a sudden, you see hundreds, thousands of British troops coming ashore in the middle of Manhattan Island towards you. With 21 inches of steel at the end of that musket, those triangular bayonets, I thought we would have won that day. Unfortunately, sitting on my horse, Nelson, I watched a disaster. The militia units broke rank and started to run up the Albany Post Road. Pennsylvania regiments did the same exact thing. I'm standing there wondering, are these the men which I'm expected to defend our liberty with? Waving my sword in the air over my head, taking the back of the blade, slapping sergeants on the head and on the back. Get these men back in line. A few days later, I write a letter about it to my cousin, London Washington. I don't know if most of you realize, the last time I was home at Mount Vernon was May of 1775. When I left those doors, I would not enter my home ever again for six years, not till September of 1781. So my cousin Lund is managing my five farms, which you know of as Mount Vernon. And I'm writing in the letters to him, stating, I wish I was never born. I bet you never expected to hear those words from General George Washington saying, I wish I was never born. That was probably the first low point at the beginning of this war. How are we going to win against a force like this when I have troops fleeing right before me? I also go on writing in the same letter that I wish I could resign my commission in the Army right now and go home. But I also know the integrity of this nation and my family is at stake. So that evening, after that disaster at Kipps Bay, we're heading north, back to the village of Harlem. When we get up there, Mr. McGowan has a farm up there. Think about the northern part of your central park, McGowan's Pass. 
You could get from the east side to the west side to the north or Hudson's River. There's Highland soldiers there waiting. Another battle ensues. Only this time, those militia units and the Pennsylvania regiments are doing their job. They hold back thousands of troops so I can head north, up the Post Road, across Spike and Dival Creek, crossing the Kings Bridge, into the Lower Yonkers, finally Upper Yonkers, to the Miles Square Road, to the Old Army Road, which in Westchester County is called Central Park Avenue that takes you to the city of White Plains. And finally, by the end of October, I have my troops in camp on Chatterton's Hill, up there in White Plains. Now, while all this is going on in between, the British are still chasing us out of New York. Finally. The British land in an area called Frog's Neck. You know it as Frog's Neck. Pell's Point. And Richard Howe lands 4,000 British and Hessian troops, pushing us further up into Westchester County. That gentleman I just told you about, Colonel Glover, that saved my 9,000 troops, save us yet again. He has 750 to 800 troops holding back those British troops so I can get to safety. Now, a couple weeks later, you have the Battle of White Plains, the second largest battle. And as you can see what we're up against, I'm losing these battles against General William Howe. I'm retreating, not because we're cowards, I'm retreating because I want to regroup. I want to be able to fight another day with my force. So I cross around November 5th, we cross River Plank into the Jerseys. There's a fortification that's set up on the hilltop on the Hudson River, opposite that other fort I told you about that was built earlier in June, Fort Washington. This fort is called Fort Constitution. Later on, it's called Fort Lee for General uh, Light Horse Harry Lee. So, oh, General Charles Lee, sorry. So while all this is going on, finally, on November 16th, the last stronghold we have on Manhattan Island Falls, the Battle of Fort Washington. Again, the garrison that's there, all 3,500 men were either killed or captured. A lot of these men were taken to Wallabout Bay, near another fort, Fort Green, where there's a monument in your modern world to those poor souls that died on ships like the HMS Jersey. And that's where these prisoner of wars are being kept. With the fall of Fort Washington, so falls your New York City that you know of as a city in your future. That happened on November 16th of 1776. So forgive me if I just go one more month. We're on the banks of the Delaware. The whole month of December, there's hit and run tactics by the Hessians and by the British against our encampment by McConkie's Ferry. Now, a lot of people like to believe the victory we sorely needed at the Battle of Trenton happened because the Hessian soldiers were drunk. Far from the truth. They were exhausted. Colonel Rawl had a small, tiny garrison in Trenton. How do I know this? I have a German baker who is working for me as a spy, getting information back to me. That German baker told me how small a garrison they had. I also found out Colonel Rawl is sending letters to General von Knipphausen, his Hessian commander in the city of New York. I need more troops, I need more muskets, I need more gunpowder. The troops are exhausted. Towards the end of December, he allows them to stand down and rest up a little bit. We were able to cross the Delaware, and we crossed the Delaware with the help of that gentleman again I told you about. Colonel John Glover, that fisherman, that sailor, who gets those Dura boats to get us to cross the Delaware. Now, originally, it was supposed to be three landing spots. There was only one because the Delaware River was choked up with ice. That victory at Trenton was the victory we sorely needed because I have troops deserting in the hundreds at night from the encampments along the McConkie, named McConkie's Ferry. I'm writing letters to Congress begging for more help, and I don't see that help coming. But that one victory enticed those troops that were about to leave. I was about to lose hundreds of more. I promised them if we had one more victory, and you get enlisted, I will get those funds for more pay for you. 
and those brave men fought that battle and were able to defeat the Hessians. That's the story of the Battle for New York, which of course stretches on a little bit later when we finally get our win at Trenton. And of course, early January 1777, a few days later, we have the Battle of Princeton. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me here this afternoon. And I was very happy to tell you my story. Thank you again. General Washington, are there any questions from the audience? Well, one of my questions is, if you look at the transportation system in your time, yes. and how slow oh, sure. trucks move, yes. it's amazing and incredible to me seeing how much land, because we all know the geography oh, sure. of this part of North America yes. today, uh, how were they able to cover so much, so so move troops so quickly in a very short time? Well, the troops alone, depending on the weather, you could potentially march an army 30 to 35 miles a day. But then you have the wagon trains, the baggage, you have the tents being loaded on these large wagons being pulled by two to four oxen. The roads are not paved. Right, right. There's no uh, tarmac like you have in your modern world. It's right. all mud. And those oxen are gonna sink. The wheels are gonna get jammed. Same thing happened in 1775. Henry Knox, you know, all know the story. He goes to Ticonderoga. He brings all those cannons to Boston, and it takes months to travel from New York to get to Boston. And then you have the mud, and you have the snow, and you have those oxen stuck, and you have men pushing those sleds with all those cannons. It's very rough to travel, even by ship. Potentially, you could get across the Atlantic Ocean maybe in about three weeks, possibly four. The reality is, on the season, you have storms. And you have a lot of storms going on. Ships get lost at sea all the time. You know, I'm gonna go a little bit further on. I'm gonna go on when New York City is being evacuated on November 25th, and that grand day when I have Sir Guy Carlton hand the keys to New York City back to me. The British formally leave, although in reality, they didn't leave till December 5th because the river was choked with ice, but that's another story. But, um, that evacuation happened without the P P uh, Treaty of Paris in the hands of the Congress. Those ships were still crossing the Atlantic Ocean, and that treaty was signed on September 9th. Here we are the end of November, but they also want to make sure that treaty gets here safely. They have three copies in three separate ships, so in case one ship sinks, you have another copy. Second ship sinks, most likely the third one at least is going to arrive here. So yes, transportation takes a long time. For my own inauguration, when I left my home on the 16th of April of 1789, I arrived in New York City on the 23rd. Short was slow going, there was a lot of grand parades, uh, talking to uh, political officials in all these towns such as Annapolis, Alexandria, Baltimore, Trenton, and, and of course, the city of Philadelphia and Elizabeth town before I crossed the harbor, that took many days. That took about a week to get from my home of Mount Vernon to here. You're only dealing with 250 miles. So transportation is very slow. When you're dealing with an army, it even gets worse. There's a reason why when we get into winter time, armies don't fight. It's almost impossible to get around. Formerly, you have the European armies like the British, the Hessians, the French, the Austrians. They all had winter encampments. So during a war, during the winter, no fighting going on. When the spring thaw comes around, that could be as early as early April, as late as early May, no fighting whatsoever. It's just impossible to get around. And then at this point, the ground's muddy. You're walking around. You can have mud up to your knees. Yes, sir. How has um, watching, um, you know, um, the, the oh, I'm sorry, man, um, um, how does like, watching, like, you know, like, for example, the Battle of Brooklyn crossing over the river with the storm and many other, yes. I'm, sure, I'm sure there are many, many, many uh, um, instances where you saw the hand of God, were you always a God-fearing person or has the war made you more God-fearing or same? Well, I try to keep it as private as possible. And a lot of the founders did. 
Some people say they saw me at uh, Valley Forge in the woods praying for my troops. Though I may not remember that, it could have happened. You know, a lot of people try to keep certain things private at this time. I attended many churches. I actually was a member of the vestry of Pohick Church near my home of Mount Vernon. And this is about a few miles out of uh, Alexandria. I was also a member of the church vestry of Christ Church that's in the village of Alexandria as well. Just like many other people here, your very own Colonel James Van Cortland of uh, his uh, Colonel of uh, Westchester County Militia who lives north of us in Lower Yonkers, which you would call Riverdale, the Bronx in your world. There was no Bronx in the 18th century. Um, I believe the Van Cortlands also tried to spread their wealth between the different churches. I know James happened to be a member of the church of St. John's Church in Upper Yonkers. His two younger brothers, Augustus and Frederick II, gave money to another church that was many miles away near the eastern coast of Westchester County, near that area of Pell's Point I told you about where Colonel Glover was during that battle, and they have a pew box there. So it's, you really try to keep it private, although some people like to be public about it, which I'm fine with that as well. You have people like Mr. Franklin that are extremely neutral about it, and of course, Mr. Jefferson, we all know about him, and not all of us get along with him. <laughs> it's not just John Adams, it's not just Mr. Hamilton having trouble, because during my second term as president, he entices Benjamin Franklin's son. Benjamin Franklin's son, by the way, ran a newspaper, not his son, his grandson ran a newspaper, just like his grandfather did, and his nickname was Lightning Rod Jr. And he's writing these pamphlets out of Philadelphia, being financed behind the scenes by Mr. Jefferson, referring to me as a monocrat, a monarchist, living in my palace of Mount Vernon, and doing the same to my colleague, John Adams. John Adams is a monocrat, and he's living in his palace of Braintree, Massachusetts, being influenced by this young man who comes from Nevis, and of course, it all goes back to the fault of Mr. Hamilton. Yes, yes, General Washington. Uh, two questions. One is, uh, how do they deal with the uh, feeding the, the troops when they were moving? You know, how did they transport food? And also, um, when you became president, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, New York City was the first capital? Correct, yes. Where did you live in New York City? Okay, well, for the first part with uh, rations for the troops, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Thompson, Mrs. Thompson, by the way, happens to be my personal chef that I hired. Could you hand me that haversack, please? All right, this is a common soldier's bag where they carry all their personal uh, belongings, they carry their food rations, it's called the haversack. This one's a little bit fancier because it's an officer's haversack. The soldiers would be issued anywhere between one pound to a pound and a half of salted meat to keep it from spoiling, a pound of uh, flour to bake their own bread, a pint of rice, a pint of beans. That's the rations that were given daily to the troops. Now remember I told you the struggles we had in places like Valley Forge. We had a shortage of these supplies. There are times a soldier gets a half pound of meat, a half a pint of beans, or a half pint of rice, and occasionally no flour to bake bread. And there are other times where they even get a third of that. So the supply chain is very difficult. The reason why my troops are suffering in places that you've heard about, Valley Forge or Morristown, not because there's no supplies. Valley Forge is a farming community, plenty of livestock, plenty of crops. But there's one thing I don't have. In 1778, we're in Valley Forge. The Congress left Philadelphia. General Sir William Howe's occupying that town. William Howe has what we call specie, gold, silver, copper coins. Most merchants, most farmers, don't want that little paper dollar called the continental dollar. It is totally worthless. So that's pretty much how the supply chain was being handled. 
But we did try to procure as much as possible. I have congressmen telling me when I was in Valley Forge, don't worry about it. We'll pay back these farmers. Take what you want. Take what I want. If I do that, William Howe go to. They're going to turn coat. They're going to become loyalists. And if I was a poor farmer and I had a large family to take care of, I would think twice about what I was doing as well. Now, as for the other question, where was my home when New York City was the capital? First off, the first capital building was the old City Hall building, which sat on the corner of Broad and Wall Street. You know it today fondly as another building called Federal Hall. That was the courthouse. That was where the Congress met, the Senate met, and the original balcony that was there, where there is a statue of my likeness, which happens to be the height of that balcony, is where I take the oath of office as president on the 30th of April, 1789. Now, the first home that was prepared for me was on number three, Cherry Street. And I believe there's a plaque on a bridge that connects that little village of Brooklyn to Manhattan Island that marks the spot where that original house was. Now, there was also a second house used during the first year. Now, New York system, the capital of, of the United States for just one year. 1790, of course, it moves to the city of Philadelphia. But there was time I spent on Hanover Square as well. So those were the two main spots where the presidential mansion was. Now, how was the presidency handled at this point? You have to remember, this is a grand experiment. We have no idea. So we're pretty much copying things that we're familiar with from Great Britain, from being a colony of Britain. So Tuesday afternoons, I'm holding levees, parties at my home, and I'm welcoming dignitaries. I'm standing there on a dais behind a velvet rope, bowing to all these dignitaries and all these people of business. The same thing's going on Thursday evening after grand dinners. So I guess that's when you get into the point where Mr. Jefferson's getting confused, con concerning that we're acting like a monarchy. We don't know how this, has, how this works. I'm carrying a sort of state at this point as well. Uh, General Washington, how did you meet your wife? Oh, that is an excellent question. That is a very good question, actually. A friend of mine, back in 1758, it was the month of March, invited me to a home of a friend, the widow Custis. Now the widow Custis has two children, Jackie or John, and her daughter's name was Patsy, which is a nickname for Martha. She also was a Martha as well. And um, when I visited her for the very first time, I guess I was trying to also make an impression because I'm leaving heavy tips with her servants at the home. Although I didn't have much money at the time, I had no business doing that, but we all want to impress somebody, especially a young lady. And she was widowed for about one year at this point. Oh, incidentally, the property she lived on the farm was called the White House. So talk about predicting the future. So if anybody asks, have I ever spent time at the White House? Actually, I have, but not the one you're thinking of. A different White House that's not too far from the village of Williamsburg. And when I first met her, I realized what an intelligent woman she was. She was well-read. She also was great at math. Remember, her husband passed away two years earlier. She's taking care of that farm, holding it for when her son comes of age. And a lot of people think of my wife of sitting there in a chair in the window, knitting or sewing, baking. It's a lot more complicated than that very smart, very astute. She knew a bit about farming, which is something, of course, you all know I'm interested in. I own five farms, which makes up Mount Vernon. So after I left, I started writing her letters and we started to converse. And I asked for a second visit. And it was that second visit that I knew, this is the woman who I want to spend the rest of my life with. So we decided, of course, to get married. <coughs> now, most people like to get married in the warmer weather, May, June, maybe July or August. Well, back in our time, especially in Virginia, a very solemn day is to get married, which ends up being the 12th night of Christmas, January 6th. And that's the day most people actually celebrate Christmas in our day. 
December 25th means nothing unless it's a, a Sunday and it's an actual uh, Sabbath. But uh, January 6th is when we had our wedding, 1759. That's when your families are together. That's when we have this large gallery. It doesn't take much for people to go there. Um, but that's pretty much it. She did visit me throughout the war. She couldn't stay the whole time. The second the spring thaw took her, we're on the move. I did not want her to be in camp because I'm sure the enemy would have some sort of scheme to try to kidnap her and end the war right there and then. But she was with me at every winter encampment. But there was one place I wish she was with me. That day on April 30th, 1789, when I'm there on the balcony taking the oath of office as president, I wish she could have seen that. She didn't arrive until May 6th. I understand why she did have to ready moving a whole entire household along with children step uh, nephews and nieces and grandchildren, moving them from Mount Vernon to the city of New York took a lot of work. Uh, General, did um, your wife have children from the first marriage? Yes, she did. And is there any living descendants still alive today? Uh, I believe there are descendants of the Custis family. Uh, one of them actually married into the Lee family, and we're dealing with a later period during the American Civil War, so it's that generation of the Lees that were Custises. That's how, when the, uh, in your future, the Un Union Army, when they attacked Mr. Lee's home of Arlington, which is now your cemetery, a national cemetery, inside that house happened to be a lot of artifacts that was descended from the Washingtons. My military tents, or people start calling them at the Museum of the American Revolution, the first Oval Office, they were owned by the Custises. They were in Arlington. Are they the, around today? Uh, they are around today. It's at the Museum of the American Revolution. They have one of the tents. There is another one in Yorktown at a museum, the National Park, uh, Yorktown Battlefield. And I believe there's still another, no, the one in Valley Forge actually was part of the tents that were given to the Museum of the American Revolution. And the sword, the sword was owned by the Custises. This iconic sword, which was made for me by a swordsmith by the name of John Bailey. John Bailey was born in Sheffield, England, immigrated to North America, lived in the village of Fishkill. He makes this sword, the one that sits in the Smithsonian Institution. <laughs> so they also, I believe, own that as well. Yes. There, there was a reference that you made earlier about posts, if you will, uh, newspapers yes. that were critical of your budgetary Yes. Uh, things for your troops. Right. Um, uh, how did you communicate to the media at that time about that? Well, and during, was your message distorted at that time? Well, during the war, there wasn't much publication of any of these letters going back to the Congress. I believe most of the original letters are in books at the Library of Congress because there were journals. And the Continental Congress kept journals throughout the whole entire war. So every letter that went back and forth, there's a Library of Congress's website that has all the founders like myself's letters. There's thousands of them there. Unfortunately, there really is no communication between me and my wife except for one letter. When I told her that I uh, accepted the nomination of the Commander-in-Chief of the Army. So, as for the media knowing how bad the troops were off, I don't know how much the media knew about that. And if they did, I could see people like Mr. Rivington, although he was a double agent, he runs the Loyalist Gazette, I could see somebody like that running away with this information, saying Washington's army is in a disaster, they don't have food, we could easily destroy them. You know, all, the, all this propaganda could have been put out there. So back then, it's, it's not like today where the second you say something, it's out there in a paper. Different world. Different world. You're not going to have reporters. I know there used to be this show 20 years ago called Liberty Kids, and they had these two cub reporters following me around, following the army, going to France with Mr. Franklin. None of that really happened. That's modern fantasy. It would be nice if we did have these things. It would be nice if we had recordings of these people from back then. We don't even know how a later president, Mr. 15, sounded either, Mr. Lincoln. Um, I think, yeah. Yes. 
Excuse me. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation for that. You're welcome. Um, did you read any? Um, uh, did you study any of the work of David Barton in preparation uh, for this uh, wonderful pattern you've given us? Most of the books I've read, there was my favorite book that I've read was written by Ron Cernow, Washington Life, 2011. He wrote a large book about that thick. I've read Ellis's books on Washington. There's several others. The only one I haven't really read is the mythical one done by Parson Weems, which actually I should because sometimes if I do a school presentation, a lot of people want to hear the cutesy stuff, which could be real, but most likely not. Like, of course, the teeth are actually made out of a hippopotamus tusk and human teeth. Ivory they used to make false teeth at this time, so you don't have wooden teeth. It's impossible to throw a dollar across the Potomac. Well, I can't really say it's impossible. I've been personally to the northern part of Maryland that separates Maryland and West Virginia and Hagerstown. The northern part of the Potomac River is no wider than from here. Where this gentleman is with the, with the spectacles and the brown shirt, you could easily throw a dollar that far. But I doubt Washington has been that part of the country, and I doubt that's what Parson Weems talking about. And as for telling a lie, well, I have a spy ring. And having the culprit spiring, I told many lies. Otherwise, if I didn't do that, the first thing that would have never happened, the French would have ended up having a sea battle off the coast of Rhode Island when they came here in 1780. And the other thing with the culprit spiring help and helping us out might have been a disaster at Yorktown. They might have had enough troops instead of another uh, 13,000, 15,000 troops garrisoned New York City. They might be down there helping out the British along the James River at Yorktown. General Washington, just a quick follow-up. Uh, so is there, so there's no living descendants from the Washington line? Not for me. Okay. From my siblings, yes. Okay. So there, there is. is. There, is. Okay. there is. I know there's a, a, a gentleman who's supposed to be a great, great, seventh great uh, nephew. Mm -hmm. He lives in Texas. He actually has a copy of the Peel painting, the one that I'm leaning on the cannon. That's in, uh, I believe there's a copy of it, uh, there's a copy of it down in uh, Virginia, at, in Colonial Williamsburg. I know there's another copy somewhere, it's probably in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's a very iconic uh, portrait. He owns a copy of that. So somebody asked him many years ago, and I think it was about 10, 15 years ago, there was an article in a, in a paper, it might have been the Times, I don't remember which paper it was, and they asked him, who do you think would be king if Washington accepted a crown. And most likely it would have been this gentleman because he would have been the, the next in line of the Senate. And that would have been a big problem because I have no heirs. I have no natural children. So what are you going to do if uh, Jackie Park Custis did not die at the age of 27 in camp, dying of tuberculosis? If he didn't die in camp and I accepted a crown, are you going to have a stepson? You're going to have Jackie Park as king? We don't know. Or think about when uh, Jackie's son passes away, I don't know who I'm going to give everything to in my will. Originally, it was going to go to Jackie, of course, early on, but he dies years earlier in camp in 1781 after the Battle of Yorktown. And his son, who follows in his footsteps, unfortunately becomes a gambler and a drunk like his father. So I end up giving everything to a nephew who was Supreme Court Justice under President John Adams, and his name was Bushrod uh, Washington. So would have we had a President Bushrod? It was a strange thing, probably. I have no idea. Yes? Um, <clears throat> can you possibly elaborate with the politics of the time you served, both general and president, when you made your farewell address about foreign entanglements yes. at the time, what you were referring to, and if you could look, if you knew what would be going on in the future, let's say 50 to 75 years into the future, Okay. can you name a time frame in the future which you believe you may not have approved of with, when it came to policy, whether it be policy for the North, for the north or South? Right. or international policy. Let's see. Foreign entanglements. 
That I was much older in the future. Yes. That I was much, I'm talking about up, up until around 1870. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to try to get there. As for the foreign entanglements, the only thing I believe, and members of my cabinet, except for maybe Mr. Jefferson, we should not be getting involved. We shouldn't be getting involved really in any treaties to help and protect another nation. A treaty, yes, for trade, that is it. The idea of government in my day is to maintain commerce and protection of property. Very simple, very small. At the end of the war, 90% of the army was disbanded. By 1783, there's 97 people left on the rolls of the United States Army. And that goes back 150 years earlier. Think about the Civil War that happened in Great Britain. Think about Oliver Cromwell, the dictator that takes over Britain. We don't want that. 1640s. 1640s. Cromwell uses the army as a tool, just like Roman emperors have. And just like uh, towards the end of my life, you have that general in France that starts doing the same exact thing, Napoleon. So. Foreign entanglements, we're giving money, like in your world, you give, you're giving all this money when we have to take care of Rome. We have to keep our nation going as well. Now, the other things, the other matters that takes place 70, 80 years later, we have, I would say, the third civil war in the English-speaking world. The first one, of course, becomes the one in Great Britain. The second one here, the war for independence. The final one we have is the war between the states here. You have the matter of slavery. Now, a lot of us in the northern neck of Virginia started to feel as older we got, well, I have a population here I have to take care of. According to law, I own this property, unfortunately. Half of them are infirm or aged. Some are too young to work. And then, how do you do the labor in between? You have to hire workers. Slavery is not economically possible to keep going. And a lot of us saw that. Now, when it came time when I, for me to leave this world, one of the things I decided towards the end is I decided to free my personal property, the slaves that I outrightly owned. I couldn't free the other half. That was technically being held by my wife for her future male heirs. She still has, at this point, a grandson. And this grandson is still alive. And that's where all that property eventually is going to go. So by law, I can't free something that doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Custis family. And then we have another dynamic going on. You have the intermarriage of slaves from both families. A lot of people who live on the northern neck near the Potomac feel that it's not right to be breaking up families. Not everybody feels this way, but a lot of us start to feel this way. The older we get, the later it gets. And you can see what problems this starts later on in life. It starts almost 100 years later when you have another big war going on. Think about people like Robert E. Lee. He's a Custis. He's related to my wife's family. You have also uh, Patrick Henry. He has grandsons in that army in the South as well. So it gets very, very complicated. When I think about it, think about it more, the more people tell me about it, the sadder it makes me feel. And I remember what Mr. Franklin said, we have a republic if we can keep it. And those are troubling words. And I guess traveling from the past to the future, I would actually find it extremely troubling. Yes? <clears throat> England was our enemy of the Revolutionary War. Yes. The War of 1812. Yes. And the Civil War, because they were backing the South. And right. Yet, and yet, in the early 20th century, they miraculously appear as our ally. Is there any person or event you can name in the late 19th century uh, that was responsible for the transformation from enemy to ally, Great Britain? I would say as time went on, because I know even as late as 
Theodore Roosevelt, most of the rifles being used in the United States Army are British Enfields. We still have commerce with Great Britain going on for a very, very long time. Take you back to the treaty, John Jay's treaty. We had that treaty. That treaty actually was signed privately because you had the other factions starting another political party that were relying on the British Royal Navy to protect us. But truth be known, we have both, en both entities seizing our ships on the seas. You have the French tre threatening us with seizing our ships on the seas as well. So it, it, it's very tricky dealing with all these things. It's, it, Great Britain later on, it, it's funny because the War of 1812 is a little footnote in the Napoleonic War against France. And a lot of it ends up, some people even refer to it as the Second War for Revolution. I know there's some uh, historians saying, if we fed, if I was captured and arrested here on the plains of Brooklyn during the Battle of Brooklyn and brought back to Great Britain, put on trial, hung as a traitor, or maybe hung in the city of New York in front of 20,000 people. They might have been another war that arose later on, somewhere close to that time period of 1812 or 1800, and it would have been a second revolution. And I have a feeling even if that revolution failed, it would have went on over and over. One of the funniest things that I found years ago, and I found this about 25 years ago, I'm on the Library of Congress's site, and I'm looking for broadsides. Broadsides are advertisements, letters, notices. And there's one that happened to have been in the British Parliament in 1771. And this document had outlined colony for colony, a scheme. Each colony in the, in the, in the, over here on the Northeast would have representatives sitting in Parliament. I believe it was one or two members of the House of Commons for each colony, one for the House of Lords. You would have uh, ambassadors or these members of the Parliament. It would have been a unified empire parliament. They would have their homes over in London, paid for and financed by each individual colony. And you look at this document, and if somebody only paid attention to this and sort of brushed it aside saying, what's this? I'm sure it's some minor member of parliament in 1771 that starts coming up with this idea, probably has a committee, trying to make a unified empire with representation. And even the islands, the West Indies, had members of parliament to sit. And also sitting there in the House of Lords. But it's something that never came about. Think about a holiday we used to celebrate up until the early 20th century. And it was called Evacuation Day. And it was the last Thursday in November every single year. That stopped at the outbreak of World War I when we started helping Great Britain. So it, wasn't to, it was not to offend them. And of course, we still want the parade. So that parade, of course, morphs into the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Mm. Thankfully, the last, I would want to say, 25 years, Federal Hall in New York City has been celebrating November 25th as Evacuation Day. And they usually have that celebration the day after Thanksgiving. I'm there in the person of Washington talking about coming into the city with these grand parades and leaving my officers after I say my farewell speech on December 4th, thinking I'm going back home forever, promising my wife I'll be home by Christmas Day, not realizing four years later, 1787, I'm called back into public life to be president of something called the Constitutional Convention. When that convention is over in September of 1787, I'm finally going back home. No, I'm not. Because early 1789, I get letters from Henry Knox, I get letters from Alexander Hamilton telling me that I'm about to be elected unanimously as the executive officer of this country. So each time I'm being pulled back again and again and again. And I guess our relationship with Great Britain over all the de decades and uh, over a century here in North America, we're, we're, we pretty much see ourselves, I guess, as the same but not quite. 
Our traditions come from Great Britain. Our, our Capitol building, our Congress and Senate is kind of almost the same. Unfortunately, it's all turned it into the House of Lords these days. When you have people there from 1975 to today, people like uh, the, the senator from New York, he's been there since he graduated college, never sat in an office in a regular building or in a shop or wasn't like his father who was an exterminator and never did anything with him and not have an understanding of finances and private businesses. I think we have a question right there. Yes. If, if the United States ever gets rid of the uh, term limits for president and since you, uh, you make it a habit to come to our timeline as, as much as you do, if we ever get rid of, would you do it again? Just on that no, slide? I find that an interesting <laughs> question only for one reason. That fateful day on December 12th, when I go out in 1799, and I'm riding my horse, which is a habit every morning when I retire, to survey all five of the farms that make up Mount Vernon. Sleep, hail, my cloak is soaking wet, so is my hair. Come home that evening. Usually I would change off into dry clothing. We'd have dinner probably around three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm sitting there in wet clothes the whole entire evening. I go to bed that night. I start coughing, not feeling well. My throat feels like it's closing down. The disease was called Quincy's. It's kind of like an extreme case of strep throat. And um, after suffering for a couple of days, Tobias Lear writes a 12-page account of what happens with my passing. And a funny thing is, I was asked by the National Park Service one year at Federal Hall, could you do a December talk on the death of Washington? So I looked at the ranger that was hiring me for this, and I, I said, what do you mean? I said, I could come as Dr. Crake, Washington's personal physician, but then again, I don't know too much in reality on medicine. So I know I'm gonna get that one person in the crowd that's a doctor asking me that question. I said, how am I gonna get around this? Tobias Lear. Tobias Lear, Washington's personal secretary, wrote the letter. I'm there at the podium reading the 12-page account. After one page, tears start coming down my cheeks because I'm reading about the death of this man I've been portraying for over 20 years. One of the park rangers said, oh, that was a lovely touch. I said, that wasn't a lovely touch. I was actually really in tears reading about the death of somebody that I grew up knowing to be one of the greatest men in history. Three days later after being buried in that tomb, the first tomb at Mount Vernon, a letter arrives, and arrives from the Capitol. And I believe it was a congressman or a senator asking, could you please run for a third term? Because they knew that John Adams was going to lose in a landslide, and they did not want the Francophile, Mr. Jefferson, to win that election. What would have I done if I was still around? I have no idea. But think about all the times, three times pulling back into public life. No, I'm going home. No, I'm retiring. I want to sit there, have a glass of Madeira wine on my patio, overlooking the Potomac River. That's all I want. I want to improve my farm. And each time when I think I'm there, we need you, Mr. Washington. Because I ended up being the unifying symbol during the war and the early republic. Think about 13 little colonies, which in reality were 13 countries. The beginning of the war, I live in New York, I'm a New Yorker. What are you talking about, America? No, I'm a British subject, I'm a New Yorker, I'm a Pennsylvania, I'm a New Jersey, and I'm a Georgian. The New England, New England's even worse. John Hancock thought that he was being chosen to be commander-in-chief of the army. I don't think my fellow Virginians, which made up most of the army at the time, would have fared well under Mr. Hancock, and I don't think they would have been happy with that either. I'm just going to go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. When George Washington left the White House, he left it in shambles, and that's a fact. Did he not understand the great symbol of, of what America had to start? I mean, when Adams went in there, he said it was just a, it was a terrible, it was terrible. I mean, did he not respect the White House? Did George just not think that it was important to the next president? 
Well, unfortunately, there was no White House yet. wasn't built yet. And when he left, there was some kind of a White no, House. No, no, not at all. Adams went into something the next time. He no. was the first no. occupant in the building that wasn't even completed yet. And yes, it wasn't a shambles. It was falling apart. Plaster coming down is there at the dining room table. I was long since dead when that building was completed. That capital was supposed to be called one simple name, Federal City, not Washington, D.C. Some people come up with the words Washington Topolis, Washington Topia, Washingtonville. These are the names that were being thrown around. That was while I was still alive. When you were in office, where was the majority of the, the time? Where did you um, preside in presidency? Well, New York for the first year. New York was the first year, and that was at the, that mansion that was called the Franklin House, which Brooklyn Bridge sits on the Manhattan side today. Then there's another one not too far across the mall from Independence Hall, and that's probably where I spent most of my time at the President's House. There. There's nothing there now, there's just ruins, and they rebuild on the ruins. It's like a computer monitor, so you can watch a little film there on the side. Uh, I would have to say it was Philadelphia. Because remember, New York saw the capital from 89 to 90, one short year. On the time of your death, what do you, in the modern equivalence, what would be your net worth? You? <laughs> well, you can go back to late 1700s. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was there any uh, accounting of what he would face? You know what? I don't remember reading anything about the finances. He was a very big property man. Property, oh, yes. And the biggest liquor. Uh, yeah. Well, later on, yeah. Later on in my life, I opened up the whiskey distillery yes, after yes. I retired, yeah, which okay. was rehabilitated back in the 1930s, but dwindled and rebuilt again, and now, now it's business. Of, of but uh, I, I, you know, property wise, he owned a lot of property. He had a lot of property. A, a lot of people think upon marriage to Martha, I inherit all this wealth. Well, no. I inherit more property. Her deceased husband was in debt. Yes? Uh, according to this, it says $780,000 net worth at death on 1799. Thank you. Of that time period? Or, uh, uh, that would probably be that time period. $800,000? Uh, well, by the time he died, 1799. That's about, that's about $150 million. Yeah. yeah. About $150 million. You've you got to remember, at this time, uh, I'll give you an example. 1776, a New York continental dollar is like having uh, $30 in your pocket. $1 worth $33 is like $100 in your pocket. Uh, they equate it now today, $594 million. Okay. How much? $594.2 in current value as of 2020. Yes, I was wrong. Now you know why that young lady back here portrays my wife, Martha Washington, <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> And um, do we have any more? We have one more question. Okay, sure, one more question. In 1776, when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, which coincides with the birth of our country, and he analyzed, um, you know, for his time, uh, international economics, all economics was national. As a matter of fact, up until very recently, the subject of economics was called national economics. Uh, the idea of individual economics or personal wealth is a very modern, modern. Oh sure, yeah. Economics, yeah. as he, as Adam Smith for, uh, yeah. saw it, uh, was national and international. Yeah. Wealth. Because all the biographies I've read about Washington, they don't really mention that at all. They don't mention his wealth. They just talked about this is what he did. This is what's going on at this time frame. But they don't mention that. They mention. Uh, Martha not having money whatsoever, but she has a lot of properties, so I obviously I'm going to inherit that. And they do talk about how uh, I was one of the few founders, if not the only one, who was never uh, in debt. I tried very hard not to be in debt. Yes? Just um, background information. Um, his expense account for the out the, throughout the war was totaled at $449,261.51. And he declined a salary of forty-eight thousand. Yes. Uh, in favor of a personal expense account reimbursement. Oh, interesting. Uh, I want to thank you, General Washington. It was my pleasure. Thank you all for having me.
thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you and uh, Larry, if we could do a quick uh, salute with each other. Okay. Yeah.